chatting in. Thanks for doing that. We'll uh, give a couple more minutes for um, attendees to join and then we'll get started with um, our event. If you are just logging in, uh, say hello in the chat box and where you are zooming in from. Looks like we have uh, some people that got rain last night, which is super exciting. and uh, run through a couple of housekeeping items and uh, then we will begin our event. So again, if you're just joining us, go ahead and uh, say hello in the chat and where you're zooming in from. Um, throughout the presentation, we are going to be hearing from a couple of uh, local leader uh, panelists and their climate perspectives, as well as, as you know, um, Representative Axney. So uh, there will be a chance at the end of the event to ask the panelists some questions. So if you think of a question as they're speaking today throughout the event, please use the question and answer box um, to the left of the chat. Um, make sure if you have a question for one individual panelist, you make sure and say which panelist you are asking the question of uh, so that we can get that to the right person. Okay, um, again, thanks for joining us today. And uh, the schedule uh, today will be uh, each of the um, three panelists will be able to introduce themselves after we hear from uh, Representative Axney. Um, she will be logging in right at 10 um, and will be with us for half an hour. Um, so she will give her remarks and then we will hear from those three panelists. Um, and then there will be a dialogue between the panelists and Representative Axney for uh, 10 minutes. And then we might be able to um, pull a question or two um, for Representative Axney before she leaves. Um, and then the last 15 minutes, so from 10.30 to 10.45, uh, we will be able to um, have the panelists answer the questions that you have for them. So again, if you have questions throughout the presentation, make sure you use the question and answer box um, next to the chat and um, make sure you see which panelist your question is for. Um, we will be recording this event and it is already recording and live on Facebook. So um, if you uh, want to watch it back, we will be sending that out in an email after the event, as well as it will be saved on our Facebook page on the Iowa Interfaith Power and Light, as well as the Center for Rural Affairs uh, Facebook pages. So if you wanted to watch anything back. Um, again, we will have from 10 to 10.30 with Re Representative Axney, and then the following 15 minutes will be for the three panelists answering questions. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping. I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kayla Bergman. I'm with the Center for Rural Affairs. Um, the Center for Rural Affairs is a nonprofit founded in 1973 in Northeast Nebraska. Um, the organization is based in Lyons, Nebraska in that Northeast corner and exists to create vibrant rural communities. Um, we have staff throughout Nebraska as well as staff in South Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa. I am personally based in our Nevada, Iowa office with three colleagues um, in this office with me. I'm gonna turn it over to Matt to introduce himself and uh, his organization. Thank you, Kayla. Um, I'm the executive director of Iowa Interfaith Power and Light, and we are a, it, we're an interfa statewide interfaith uh, organization that works to empower Iowans of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change. And, and um, we, we do a number of programs um, really working with the child. Our call to people is 
who God, who you, who God needs is who you are. And so it's really about helping us identify our, um, who we are as people of faith, as uh, parents, as farmers, as students, as uh, faith leaders, um, as teachers, whoever we are grounded in our faith is who God needs uh, for us to solve the climate crisis. And really the climate crisis is part of um, our call to environmental justice. So I think at this time, uh, unless someone inter interrupts me, uh, I'm gonna call us to prayer, to reflection and prayer, um, so that when Representative Axney arrives, uh, we're ready to, to go right into, into her pr presentation because she has a, a limited time. And as we always do at Iowa IPL, we try to gather in reflection. And this morning, I wanna start with um, our reflection from the UN Environmental Sabbath Program. And this is from Earth Prayers from Around the World, edited by Elizabeth Roberts and Elias Amadon. We join with the earth and with each other to bring new life to the land, to restore the waters, to refresh the air. We join with the earth and with each other to renew the prairies, to care for the plants, to protect the creatures. We join with the earth and with each other to celebrate the rivers, to rejoice in the sunlight, to sing the songs of the stars. We join with the earth and with each other to recreate the human community, to promote justice and peace, to remember our children. We join with the earth and with each other. We join together as many and diverse expressions of one loving mystery for the healing of the earth and the renewal of all life. minutes until Representative Axie join us. So I'm going to again run through a couple of housekeeping items for you and then introduce the panelists before um, she gets here. So again our schedule, uh, Representative Axie will be here from 10 to 10:30, and she will be giving some remarks right at 10 um, and then each of the panelists will be sharing um, their climate perspectives and then there will be 10 minutes of dialogue between them. Um, again, we will be able to uh, pull a couple of questions from the participants during that time. So if you do have a question for um, any of the panelists or Representative Axney, please write those in the question and answer box to the left of the chat. Um, if they are for an individual um, and not the whole group, make sure you um, identify which panelist um, or speaker you uh, are asking the question of today. Um, if you are live on Facebook, make sure you do the same um, format for questions in the comment box. So um, you can just you know comment in the, in the comments section, and we actually have somebody that will be transferring it over to the Zoom um, so that we can see uh, those questions as well. Um, again, we uh, will be recording this event, and so if you um, you know want to watch it back, we'll be sending that out to all participants that registered, as well as it will be saved on Facebook. So. Um, you will be able to uh, review the event. Okay, well, I will um, kind of give a, a brief, a brief overview of each of the, or introduce each of the panelists um, before Representative Axney um, joins us. So first off, we have uh, Seth Watkins from Clarenda, Iowa. He's a farmer, um, and that I believe is in Page County, correct? Seth? Oh, here we go. Thank you. Yeah, panelists, you're welcome to turn your video on. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, and then we have Michelle Franks, the executive director of Golden Hills RCD, which is a nonprofit based out of Oakland, Iowa. And then we have Reverend Dr. Jacqueline Thompson of the Burns United Methodist Church in Des Moines. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, again, we will be able to hear from you uh, just after um, Representative Axney joins um, and gives her opening remarks. And it looks like we are, we have her joining now. Good morning. Good morning. 
Good morning. How are all of you? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Look at that beautiful uh, background. Uh, I think that's in Pottawatomie County. I know we've got some Pottawatomie County folks here. <laughs> Love it. Love it. All right, Matt, I will, we'll be able to turn our videos off here and um, let you roll. Okay. All right. Well, Cindy Axney is a fifth generation Iowan. She's a former 4-H member, a six on six basketball player alumni, a small business owner, parent, community activist, member of Sacred Heart Catholic Church, and U.S. Representative from Iowa's 3rd Congressional District. But most importantly today, and for today's forum, she's helping Iowans lead in finding and implementing solutions to the climate crisis. Welcome, Representative Axney. Thank you for joining us today for this important discussion of Iowa climate solutions. Well, I'm so glad to be here today. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you for all of our hosts who have put this together. Uh, I'm really grateful to see all of you joining to talk about this really important topic. Uh, I know that many of you have worked on this for years. I, I so appreciate you bringing it into uh, the faith for people to understand how important it is, uh, not just for our planet, but for the people that live here to ensure that we're looking at the issues of climate change and how they impact people's lives. Because certainly those who uh, live on the margins, uh, who have the uh, least opportunity to have their voice heard, um, to have the funding that they need to withstand the difficulties that we face with climate change, uh, are the ones who are the most impacted. And so I'm so grateful to have all of you here who are working so hard on that issue uh, for so many people to make sure that we've got an opportunity to address uh, the climate crisis and also uh, steward people uh, through that process. I did wanna go over some of the things that we're, go we're, we're, we're working on right now. And, and I'll, I'll tell you folks, it's, uh, it's been a priority in our house to ensure that we're looking at things from a climate eye. And that doesn't just mean uh, with specific policy in place. It also means that within our respective committees, we are looking at ways to uh, bring climate into uh, looking at policy that could work for that. So for instance, I sit on um, the Financial Services Committee uh, and we are dedicated to making sure that we've got opportunity uh, for folks to uh, look at climate as an entrepreneurial opportunity because we believe that it's going to bring a lot of job opportunities to folks um, as well as help us with the issues that we're dealing with with our environment. Um, and we know that we've got a responsibility to look at our financial systems within this country uh, and, and businesses to ensure that they're appropriately addressing the concerns that we're facing now uh, and in the future when it comes to climate. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, within uh, the House uh, for us to be able to look at uh, issues of climate. I'd like to point out just a few of them and I wanna make sure I don't forget them. So I brought, brought a few notes uh, here with me. What I just talked about uh, a second ago was about the work that we could do within our committees. And so for an example to give to you was uh, a bill that I've been a part of, which is the National Climate Bank. Uh, and the National Climate Bank actually establishes, I'm gonna find the exact money, 35 billion of federal funds that can leverage more than a trillion dollars in total investment. These things go for updated infrastructure, improving energy efficiency, financing projects that will move us towards a clean energy environment and push our economy towards clean energy at the same time. So that, uh, that's something that I was behind that we passed out of uh, the house. And as a matter of fact, it made it into HR2, our clean energy and sustainability accelerator uh, piece. This amendment was added to it. So we found a way within financial services to ensure that we are participating in helping out with the issues that we're facing uh, across this country when it comes to clean energy. I want you to also know that as we've moved throughout COVID-19, we have not forgotten that this is a pressing issue. And, and for many people, uh, all you know, supporters, this is a number one issue and we have not forgotten that. And so we have made sure that within the policies that we've put in place or tried to get uh, passed into law that we're addressing uh, co the uh, clean energy issues as well. So for example, in March, I signed on to a letter urging uh, the clean energy workforce 
in coronavirus relief. So we're trying to put in, into our relief packages opportunity for people to go back into, uh, you know, help us with the renewable energy, but not, but not just that, support our clean energy sector uh, as everyone has taken an unfortunate dive um, economically during these really difficult times. In June, I joined my colleagues to send a letter to House leadership asking for changes for clean energy tax incentives to make sure that those were extended uh, through COVID because a lot of times policy doesn't work uh, when other things are being put on top of it during emergency times like this. Specifically, this was requesting that the investment tax credit, the ITC, or the production tax credit, the PTC, be received as a direct payment because many firms right now are unable to leverage this credit uh, because uh, of inability of financing. So we're always trying to find ways as we move through issues to ensure that we're protecting the policy around uh, climate as well, which is what this, this piece did. And we urge our leadership to make sure that we're taking care of this as we deal with the difficulties uh, with COVID. And then in July, we passed HR2, the Moving Forward Act, which is our big infrastructure bill, which is really focused on climate. So much of the, piece, the pieces within the infrastructure bill move us in the right direction uh, to a net zero uh, economy, move us to the direction of clean energy, ensure that what we're doing in this country from an infrastructure package on, on the very baseline, things like roads and bridges, we're addressing in a way that uh, addresses our climate issues and is also environmentally friendly. So we've passed that bill during this whole time as well. But I'd say the biggest thing that's happening right now, in addition to really making sure that we stand up for climate amidst an administration that unfortunately wants to take us backwards. So we've signed on uh, written bills to put us back in the Paris Climate Accord, things like that, that we're trying to do to ensure that we're defending our environment and defending America's inclusion in uh, climate issues around the world. But in addition to that, uh, we're trying to get agendas out there that will move us forward in the right direction, in particular, when we know that there's going to, when there will be leadership, hopefully across the board, uh, in both the House and the Senate or the presidency that understands what an important topic climate is and how important it is to address this. So uh, very early on uh, in our uh, term, 116th Congress, uh, Speaker Pelosi structured the Select Task Force on Climate uh, put uh, uh, one of my rep uh, colleagues, friends, and representatives, uh, Representative Castor from Florida, uh, in charge of the Select Task Force on Climate. Um, this moves us towards a, a net zero uh, economy by 2050, but it moves us also in the second half of the century towards a net negative uh, society. So that's a very ambitious goal, and it establishes interim targets to help us get there. There's multiple industries that are addressed uh, in, in this uh, select uh, task force on climate policy paper, which came out to be about 500 uh, pages and is being used uh, to put policy into place. As I mentioned before, we use all that information to be thinking about what these bills look like, but we'll be taking that uh, that, that massive piece of, uh, of, of, of information and data gathering and using it to ensure that the bills that we put forth to address climate uh, will really hit the mark. And so we're, we took all the in different industries, the folks that were part of this and really looked at how we can improve that. Well, I found out that they were working on this and I wanted to make sure that Iowa wasn't being left behind and that beautiful farm scene that you see behind me actually had opportunity and wasn't being looked at strictly from the perspective of the impact that agriculture has on, uh, on climate, but opportunities that we could have here uh, in agriculture on climate. So I went up to Kathy Castor and I said, did you know that Iowa's number two in wind production in the country? I did not know that. Well, I do because I ran the state's energy and environment plan and helped make that a, a, a possibility for us. Did you know we're 16th when it comes to solar? Did you know that if we could get broadband to every corner of this country and out to places in rural Iowa, we could use precision agriculture, meaning we could control input on every inch of land uh, that we farm, helping us control water input, pesticides, runoff, uh, tilling that impacts carbon, uh, all uh, giving us opportunity to figure out how we can find solutions uh, to impact climate. And she's like, I did not know that. 
So I had an opportunity to be a part of putting some of that information together in that policy, myself and another colleague on agriculture committee to ensure that when they're looking at an industry that's really important to the state of Iowa to provide jobs and put food on the table for not just the people in our district, but of course this great state and this great country that we're looked at as a partner and somebody who is solving this, this problem uh, along uh, with government because that's really how it should be. And that's how we're gonna get people involved. So we were able to get some good pieces in there. Also meaning that farmers will have a seat at the table. Iowa will have a seat at the table when it comes to agriculture and climate when we craft a really intensive bill that I know will someday be there and hopefully sooner than later. But for a, key, a few key aspects so that you know, some of the key pieces that came out in this policy piece regarding agriculture is to increase carbon sequestration and reduce uh, greenhouse gases by increasing financial assistance to farmers to deploy conservation programs, expand the USDA's research on climate change reduce food waste. Uh, food waste is one of my, I tell you folks, that sits, that, that, that hurts me, pains me, the, the food waste in this country. Um, so reduce food waste and transportation emissions by supporting local and regional food systems, which I think is really important. And we've seen as COVID has impacted the state and our meat packing plants, how important it is to get back to more regional processing. And then establish a low carbon fuel standard uh, to help us build on the RFS and increase demand for clean biofuels. So we're already seeing an opportunity for our state uh, to not just be key players in addressing the issues that we're facing, but bring opportunity to the people that live here as well. That's just a little bit of what's a slice of what's happening uh, in Congress to focus on climate, to focus on our environment. I hope that I can stick around uh, in this seat and, and, and represent all of you and, and your voices in Washington as we move forward uh, into another Congress, which will be the beginning stages of discussing the next farm bill, which could be incredibly impactful in dealing with climate uh, and helping economically every single person involved uh, in rural America uh, and certainly in rural Rural Iowa. So thank you so much for having me on here for this discussion with these great folks. Thank you for all the work that you do. We couldn't do this without each other helping uh, one another. And I know that that is at the baseline of everything that you do. And the framework is to um, is help people live better lives and to make sure that you're a voice for those who don't have it, have one when it comes to things like this. So thank you so much for all that you do. And I'm so proud to be your voice in Washington. Thank you, Representative Axney. Um, my name is Kayla Bergman with the Center for Rural Affairs based out of our Nevada office. Um, I will be emceeing the rest of the event and want to introduce to you um, our panelists from your district. So first off, we have Seth Watkins. He's a farmer from Clarinda, Iowa, and I'll give him a couple of minutes to introduce himself and tell his climate story. All right. Um, hi, Congresswoman. Thank you for being with us. And uh, this will be pretty quick, but Essentially, what I've learned from other farmers and Leopold Center at Iowa State and uh, gosh, NRCS and a lot of groups is that when I start to reduce my carbon footprint with some practices like no-till, um, utilization of co cover crops, um, I'm fortunate I still raise cattle so I can utilize grazing. Uh, it's been a very good way to care for the type of land we have in your district. So I'm looking, you know, you're sitting with a background of the Lust Hills and then the Southern Iowa Drift Plain, some of those areas. We have challenges unique to us that aren't the same as farmers may face in the Des Moines Lobe or some of our other production areas. Um, but long story short, the more I have reduced my carbon footprint, the more I've lowered my costs and the more good things have come from it. Uh, this is a real challenge because the reality is our current farm, farm bill focuses directly on uh, the conversion of marginal land to tillable land and focuses on production. It incentivizes these things and really, uh, to be quite blunt, doesn't always incentivize us to do the right thing. And we're seeing the externalities from it. Um, you know, we can even talk about ethanol. Uh, I understand the frustrations people are seeing and the frustrations we're seeing from the waivers that I know you're trying to get done away with. But to a certain degree, we came in with this production and we subsidized it and we incentivized more production. And then we realized we had to do something. So then we came in with ethanol, which is a subsidized fuel source, which led to more production and more conversion of marginal land. And uh, 
I guess in a nutshell, it's just really decimated our landscape and some of our opportunities. So wrapping up in one sentence, I, I tried to write this down as well as I could. Um, our ag practices, our farm bill needs to incentivize the regeneration of the natural resources we depend upon and, and not, uh, unfortunately, it's destruction like we're doing right now. Um, this simply means that uh, to a certain degree, there's some practices that do pollute, um, whether it's, it's CAFOs or uh, feedlots, and we feed cattle also. But I think we're at a point when we look at how much money is available to spend, we really need to target our efforts on those practices that regenerate and protect our natural resources that we all depend upon. And, you know, speaking to someone whose brother is a, is a retired oil executive, um, if your practices pollute or uh, destroy resources beyond a sustainable rate and there's a better way to do it, then I think a very basic starting place is you should internalize those costs in your operation so we have more money to go into other things. Representative Axey, do you want to um, respond to Seth or would you like me to move on to the other panelists? It's, it's whatever you would like, I'm happy to. Sure, Seth, it's so good to see you. You too. Um, you know, listen, I, I'm so grateful for the practices that, that you put in place. And we have so many great stewards of our environment um, here in Iowa. And, I, and, and I, I agree with you. That's why I'm anxious to stay there, work on the farm bill, which won't be in this next term, but will be, I believe, the next one. But we'll begin the stages of it, obviously. And it's really important that we have people representing um, row crop states that have understand that we've got to be, um, con, you know, we, we have to conserve our soil, we've got to conserve our water, we've got to conserve our land, we've got to make sure that we've got the opportunity in 25 years that, you know, my grandpa had uh, when I was growing up with the, you know, wonderful nutrients in his soil that have, uh, in many cases, been depleted across our state. And so I couldn't agree with you more. We have farmers across the state who want to do different crops. Um, you know better than I do, certainly with your background, that at, at, uh, you know, at any given point in time in the history of the state, we were you know, 12 to 15 crops. We, we, to your point and why I brought up processing, we have such limited ability to produce you know, other, other types of plants and that people would like, like to harvest um, because of the way that we're structured in government and the way that we've um, subsidized people to, uh, you know, make the decisions that they do. I tell this to people all the time who don't understand anything about agriculture. I said, you know, our farmers are really forced into a position where for them to be able to put food on their table uh, and to afford some things in life that, you know, they've, they've got to conform to the way essentially that government has subsidized agriculture for them to be able to be successful for their families. And, you know, what that's done is increase, you know, I think taken away opportunity for us to be diverse uh, when it comes to the types of crops that we grow for us to be able to your point, um, you know, put in more cover crops and do more CRP um, to do all the things that we would like to do. So I, I, I agree with you. We've got to make sure that within policy, we're not constantly incentivizing um, uh, whether it's whether it's you know thinking about our you know corn or soybeans or whether it's thinking about other industries that we're incentivizing that we could probably move away from and look to cleaner energy and figure out how to make that happen, we've got to do that. We're at that point. We're at a point in this country where we've got to take this up to the next level, um, and that means really looking at everything holistically and being you know and ensuring that those farmers who that like you described who might be more everything's really way everything for them is based on you know, corn and soybeans and, and what, and their subsidies. And, and we've got to figure out how do we can transition people to, to other products that, and we also need to create new markets for those. So it's a whole, you know, this as well as I do. It's not just, we tell one person to do one thing, or we can have an opportunity to put it in place, unless we put those structures in place, like production, uh, processing and markets, we don't have opportunities for people. So that's where it's going to be really important for us to think about holistically as a region, uh, as a country, um, and you know, as far as in what individual farmers want to do, and what's important for our to feed people in this country, because it pains me that we've got, you know, children in our own backyard who 
barely know where their one meal a day is going to come from in our state. That's terrible. Um, where are we as a state when we can't even feed our own children and we produce food in our backyard? So I think to your point, Seth, I think there's so much opportunity. We're going to be able to work this in a way that benefits farmers, benefits rural economy, and does better by uh, our, the whole entire uh, ag industry than what we're currently seeing right now. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Michelle Franks. She's the executive director of Golden Hills RCD, which is a nonprofit based in Oakland. Um, she, her uh, nonprofit works in um, various natural resources protection um, related to climate, and she uh, is welcome to share her story now. Thank you. Um, like you, Representative Axney, I'm, I'm at least a fifth generation uh, farm kid uh, from Western Iowa, and mostly my family, my dad's side of the family is from the Lost Hills, uh, and that's where my family hails from. And so I've worked with Golden Hills RCD uh, for almost seven years, and our organization was founded in 1981 in response to the farm crisis. Uh, built around the idea that the nexus between natural resource conservation and rural development um, led by local people who can make the best decisions for themselves uh, is really kind of the mission of, of, that we work under. And we've continued to do that. Uh, Golden Hills over the years has been involved with a number of, of, of initiatives, including local food system development, um, helping to uh, develop alternative crops like the grape industry in Western Iowa, um, looking at ways of helping small um, poultry producers aggregate their product uh, and process collectively. Um, and, you know, we, so we've, we're really kind of looking at that sort of small scale impacts that uh, we can have with local people. And again, a lot of that is driven by interest and, and balance and, um, you know, areas that people within Southwest Iowa feel are, are important. And so, you know, we've had an opportunity to work with a lot of farmers like Seth who are taking the lessons that we're hopefully teaching to people about the importance of the prairie uh, ecotype or the prairie uh, ecosystem and how you know the, our original native um, growing system has benefits to some of our agricultural economy as well. And so you know prairies are are very good at being able to retain water in times of drought. They're also able to uh, filter water that is less than desirable back into our water systems. Um, they're also able to regenerate the soil that they grow in. And so currently what we're involved with, there are things that are more reactionary rather than, than um, you know, advocating for new things in, in relation to climate change. So as you know, in the last 15 years, our corner of the state has had three catastrophic floods. And uh, I live in Mills County. And so I've seen firsthand what that has happened, what, how that's impacted our communities and our farmers and, and you know, people that are living on the margins in those areas. And uh, so currently we're working through the Iowa watershed approach um, and local landowners, both private and public to implement about over $5 million worth of cost share projects that will help hold water when the next flood comes. Um, and so what we're doing is, is reactionary stuff right now. I'd really like us to get to point where there are resources that can help farmers like Seth and many other farmers in our area um, to be able to adapt and, and do practices that, um, that are more regenerative in nature rather than just responding to, to crisis changes. And I think um, long-term that's going to help uh, our landowners, our, our stewards of the land be able to withstand some of these um, uh, severe weather events that we have seen, whether it's flood or it's, you know, uh, drought or, you know, storms that are <laughs> inland uh, hurricanes, you know, I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from um, the way that the land and the plants and the ecosystems have historically grown in the Lost Hills and be adapted to a, a broader area. So, um, Again, so we're, we're focused primarily on responding to local ideas, local wishes, local collaboration to address some of these issues. And uh, I just appreciate your, your interest and, and advocacy for the work that's happening here. Yeah, well, my pleasure, Michelle, and thank you so much for all you do. And, and you know, unfortunately, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. Right now, I think for so many people, it's, 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 it's all, it's reactionary. We aren't able, as I mentioned to you, what am I doing right now? Working on how do we ensure that we support clean energy during COVID when the, when the economy is literally falling apart so that 
um, we don't lose sight of that. And those businesses who had actually been moving down the road, actually doing some positive things can continue to receive the incentives, even though policy indicates they can't. Um, you know, what, what about, you know, putting, uh, you know, this, even this National Climate Bank, you know, it's about, it's about chasing funding, getting, getting funding into this whole thing. We're still not at a point, you know, where we and where we all, all of us know we need to be, which is leading the agenda for, you know, God's earth and, and everyone that lives here on changing people's hearts and minds about protecting this great, wonderful universe of ours. And so I, I'm with you, it, you know, so much, we, how many, how long have we been talking about this? How many of you just like me have had a composter sitting in a compost in Iowa in the middle of winter, you know, for years on end and, you know, and, and have tried, have, you know, picked up garbage, have done all the little, you know, things and knowing full well that the big massive scale of things still needs to, to really get out there. And we continue to fight back against it. Certainly we're fighting, unfortunately, within this administration um, as in particular, we see, uh, you know, uh, 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 countries like Syria and others who have been so impacted, uh, the, you know, by climate um, and, and why we've seen so much unrest um, there. And we see that this administration, you know, doesn't understand these types of things and doesn't understand that we need to get in and support uh, and, and stay in accords and stay in and support countries and do the things that we need to do. So we're just not at a point right there. And we've all got to make that a priority. I hope that this is the uh, time to do it. I hope that we have the impetus in government. I, um, I think we do. And I th certainly believe that we've got it on the ground. And I think that people are getting frustrated. People want to know the, the impact of their life on uh, you know, our environment. Um, and they're making it a priority to address it. So keep, let's all keep working at this. Uh, I think you know, the, the day's coming where we're going to get some really solid pieces in place to really move us in the right direction. Because right now, a lot of it is maintenance until we can make that happen and ensuring that we're not hurting things any more than we already are. So thanks for the decades <laughs> and uh, years of work that you've been doing, um, you know, to make sure that uh, we're, you know, we're helping our farmers and um, just as you did with uh, Seth and um, couldn't be more grateful. This is the kind of conversations as we move towards another farm bill that I'll be wanting to have with all of you uh, as we look at what that policy is going to look like. If I could just jump in with one real quick thing. So there is a question that popped up about, you know, how, does, how has COVID impacted the work here? And one of the things that we've seen is that, that more of the public is engaged with our natural spaces, with our parks, with our trails uh, than have ever been. And, you know, people are hiking through the Lost Hills for the first time ever. And I think that there is, um, I think what I'm, what I'm seeing, and, and again, not terribly scientific, but what I'm seeing is that people are more connected to the land. And um, because of this, they are, you know, recognizing that there is a diversity of, of prairie plants that are growing in the hills, that there's this landscape that is unique in the world um, that has done a dance with the Missouri River for, for eons. And, you know, I think that this awareness that people are having of the natural spaces uh, it has been a positive thing that has come out of the pandemic. People are more inclined to do that. And hopefully we can capture that interest and, and build on a more individual connection to you know, making your own mark uh, with regards to climate, with with conservation, and to hopefully, you know, keep moving that forward. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. All right, our last panelist is Reverend Dr. Jacqueline Thompson of Burns United Methodist Church in Des Moines, um, having the faith um, and climate perspective today. Uh, good morning, uh, Representative Axney. How are things in D.C.? You know, we're ready to go. Oh, oh that's frightening and <laughs> perhaps a blessing. So anyway, I like to tell people that I used to work in a county with no stoplights, no movie theaters, and no high B. And now I work in a zip code with no Starbucks. So I have been to uh, the far ends. Uh, when I lived in a small rural town, uh, we always felt that all the attention and all the money was directed toward urban areas, you know, or college towns. And uh, now that I live in Des Moines and, I, and, and work at a 50314, we think that everything's directed to the richer zip codes and that we are left behind. 
And so I see a lot of similarities between uh, where I work now and the, the small rural town where I, where I used to work. And uh, a couple, I was, I was really intrigued with your National Climate Bank because one of the things, uh, there are several things, but one of the things I feel is missing is the help with infrastructure in our smaller communities and in our um, uh, lower socioeconomic zip codes. Um, we have individuals as well as businesses that cannot uh, refit their structures, you know, or their homes to, for clean energy. And uh, it, sometimes it's just because a lack of folks that can do the work as well as lack of money. And so uh, the, that results in high energy bills, which results in you, uh, sometimes evictions or energy shutoffs. And uh, that is not the standard of living that we want to have for our folks that live in Iowa. Uh, green spaces especially in our urban areas, but also in our, our smaller communities. So people think just because you're surrounded by farmland, you have access to trails and green spaces and parks, and that's not necessarily true. Um, I lived in a community of 700 where 100 families came to the food bank because they were food insecure, surrounded by farms and all kind of corn and soybeans and, and product, and yet we had people that were, were, were food insecure. Um, I'm a big one for public transportation. And what we, we've seen, it's not that we don't have public transportation, but the efficiency of our public transportation is not conducive to uh, giving up cars, giving up that high carbon emission. It is not conducive to getting people to their jobs. Um, Especially in rural communities, you know, uh, I lived in a town where the, the, the public transportation was only available Monday through Friday. You know, it was only available from nine o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the evening. You know, uh, depending on your job situation, that doesn't work. Um, natural da disaster recovery. Uh, I'm walking through a neighborhood right now where we still have trees that have not been taken care of. And if those are not taken care of, we're gonna lose that, that canopy. We need to be replanting the trees that are lost. You know, what, what, what that looks like in terms of, you know, future generations. And, and then lastly, I'll just say that we need to educate our electorate on what all this means. You know, we say climate change, we say environmental practices, we say we're gonna be stewards of the land. Uh, I'm sure Seth and Michelle probably have a little easier time of that where they are, but where I am right now, a lot of our folks don't know what that means and they don't know how they can contribute to that. And so education, I believe is, is important. I know our 4-H programs do great work in that area, Iowa State, some of our extension services, but still we need to make sure that that environmental education is reaching even down into our young people. And so, uh, as we're saying, I'm, I'm just really glad to be part of this discussion. I'm glad what everyone has said, but I also, also want to remind people that, you know, green space is more than a concrete ballpark. Thank you. Yeah, Reverend, thank you um, so much for that. And, and you, you couldn't be more spot on in regard to the issues that we face in rural America, but also urban America and how closely those are tied. Um, you know, when I first started running for office, one of the or first towns I visited was Mount Air in Ringgold County. Um, they told me how they had to pool their money together out of their own pockets uh, to buy new street lamps for the town square because there just was no money to make that happen. Now imagine if that happened here in the East Village or whatever in downtown Des Moines. Are those, those business owners, those people who are, live down there and anybody else who wants to shop would expect that to be up and running within 24 hours. And, and yet these people waited months, you know, to years to, to get new street lamps. I'll tell you what, when I got to Congress um, after, after the floods, uh, Michelle, um, you know, we uh, and, and got the funding for that and moved that agenda forward and got the policy in place and all that. I remember being on the floor and I was taking a vote 
And I looked up at the screen and people's votes up there and I thought, my goodness, there's 50 reps out of California and 40 out of New York and 30 out of Florida. And I could go on and on and on. I'm like, I've got to be the voice of 10 representatives if I'm going to get something done for this state. And I truly realized then at that point, even though I've been able to get some things done that this is why states like Iowa have been left behind. We're outnumbered. We got, you know, even, even they might be Republicans and Democrats in California, they're still working together on a lot of the issues. And a lot of them are mostly on the same party anyhow. So they're really working together on the issues and they're pushing agendas forward and they're getting support for them. And it's why the majority of economic development money in this country, fully about half of it goes to three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. The rest of us eke out the rest of it. And imagine when you get down to a state like ours, lower population than some of the other states even, less urban centers, less representation, why we struggle, why Mount Air has to buy lights on their own. Because if we're still having trouble in the big urban areas, like you've said, Reverend, making sure people have what they need in those communities, and these are the urban areas with higher tax base and all that, imagine what our rural areas are like. We've got such a long way to go, folks, here uh, in realizing that the equity across this country has been extremely limited. Um, it's been heavily focused on the more populated states and those who've had more opportunity to get support for them uh, all along. And then they capitalize on that and they and, and have greater opportunity as a result of it. So, you know, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying, uh, Reverend, and, and I'm seeing a, a tie into this whole conversation here that this is the time where we can step up as a state who is so impactful when it comes to climate, who truly knows the answers to solving the problems when it comes to climate related to the agriculture industry and have people listen to us because we're gonna have an opportunity uh, to bring viability to our farmers, to our rural communities, to our urban communities, because when we can uh, deploy new ways, uh, you know, new ways to farm, new products to bring to market, um, you know, new processing opportunities, we create jobs, we, we create viability in rural communities and urban communities. And so I think it's, you know, we're poised to be at a place here in Iowa to be at the forefront of opportunity, but it's going to take all of us um, from a local to a federal level to make sure everybody understands how relevant our voices are. And I would just close by uh, you're, you're saying too, you know, when I, when I talk to our farmers about the issues that we're facing, you know, we, we just had the derecho, which has impacted our corn, but we also have drought right now in Southwest Iowa. Prior to that, we had a trade war. Seth, you talked about the renewable fuel standard waivers. Uh, that, and if you were in uh, Mills County, some parts of Pot and Fremont, then last year you had the flood and you're still, you've got silt on your land and you can barely, you know, a lot of it's not even, can't, you can't farm it. Um, we've been taking hit after hit, but if I ask my soybean farmers and we think just talk trade war, they believe that that, that we've lost, um, you know, we'll, we'll lose a full 25% of our market. That's a lot. We expect to gain back 15% in a 10 year period, but that's only 15% over 10 years. So as we're moving down the road, we're still not getting what we were just trying to catch up. And so that, you know, we'll never catch up. And so we've got to find new opportunities here for our farmers because right now, and, and to Seth, to your point about all of our eggs in one basket, all of our eggs are in one basket. And when this administration is honestly not doing their job and negotiating an appropriate uh, uh, trade. And I think we need to hold China accountable. I don't have any issues with that. On many levels, they need to be held accountable from current, you know, making sure they don't manipulate markets and things like that. Uh, but we also have to make sure that we get things done. Um, and so we've got to, you know, make sure that we are stepping up and helping our farmers find new opportunity and new markets, helping people in our urban areas, Reverend, as you mentioned, you know, be a part of that because I think that they can be. I think they can be from a vendor perspective. I think they can be from a customer perspective. You know, I've talked to my friend, uh, Representative Akhail Abdul Samad, who's here in the Des Moines area. You know, he's we he he serves he serves areas that are really um, underrepresented that don't have a lot of opportunity that are inner 
your city. We, you know, he wants to bring aqua, aquaponics there. We want to make grow food for those communities. I think there's so much that we can do to tie in our more rural areas with our urban areas, work together and bring viability to everybody. Um, and to your point, um, all of you have brought up, we've got to get people, you know, back to understanding where their food comes from. It's why we've got to integrate these things into our urban areas. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that don't want, you know, they, they, they feel like oh, if I close my eyes and I don't have to recognize any of this, then, then it'll all be okay. Well, no, it won't, folks. If you don't like what's happening in a CAFO, if you don't like what's, you know, happening to our environment, uh, you know, closing your eyes and not, not looking at it and just hoping somebody else is going to take care of it is, is, is not what's going to happen because you don't want to recognize the way that you're, some people don't want to recognize the way that they're, um, they're a part of the process by just accepting the, the way things are structured. So we've got, to, we've got to start bringing our urban and rural together when it comes to these things. And I think that's probably a fairly new thing within the farm bill itself. But we also know that that farm bill represents things like SNAP. Um, you know, we've got to make sure that we're feeding all of our, 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 our folks who need support. Um, it, you know, helps with our schools, helps with food banks. All of USDA is huge when it comes to rural economic viability as well. So I'm looking forward to making sure that I am the voice of 10 representatives and joining with my colleagues to make us a, a state of 40 representatives, even though we only would have four and bringing these opportunities to back here to Iowa. Thank you to Representative Axney for participating in the conversation today. Uh, we are going to be sticking around for um, participants to get a chance to ask our panelists questions for a couple of minutes. But we at the Center for Rural Affairs and Iowa Fa Interfaith Power and Light really appreciate you joining in the in today's excuse me today's discussion. Um, again, we are, we're going to stick around, so you're welcome to leave um, if you have to go. But again, we really appreciate the discussion today. Well, thank you so much. I'm I have to hop off, but I do believe there may be some of my staff on possibly hanging on to answer some questions. Um, but thank you for all you do. Stay safe. Um, and as I like to say, if you say a solid Cindy Axney distance away from people, that's a solid six feet. So you're good to go. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Have a good one. for the discussion there. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in um, and I will uh, make sure to ask those to the individuals. Um, first off, uh, Seth, I wanted to start with you here. Um, what federal policies or programs, if any, are important to you for addressing climate change um, that you are either participating in or would like to, um, to have available for participation? An example might be, um, you know, the CSP program or any other um, conservation financial programs? I think, I guess kind of bluntly the one it's more, as I look at my fellow panelists, I'm reminded of all the places we need money in this country right now. And also it kind of drives home that right now while it's necessary because of failed policy, agriculture is getting a lot of money that if we could do things a little differently, maybe that could go somewhere else. So I think the, the lowest hanging fruit I see, the thing I battle with the most is um, number one, the way we handle federal crop insurance on highly erodible land and wetlands. Uh, we have an oversupply of grain. This is, a, this is our problem and it drives down the price. Yet we have, it actually incentivize the conversion of this kind of land and uh, continue to incentivize it. And in reality, I think we'd be much better off either actually enforcing compliance on that. If you're going to farm that kind of land, you have to make sure that the soil loss is below a sustainable rate. Or maybe it's time or say, what if we go back to what we know works what if we applied technology and some common sense and went back to uh, paying farmers for ecological services by actually uh, using supply management and putting that highly erodible land and wetlands back into uh, wild spaces and grazing and let it do its job? Um, the specific example I use right now in our county, 
I've got 160 acres of CRP that I've been slowly converting back to pasture, but it's been 100% out of pocket because our county's budget is exhausted on uh, um, manure systems for CAFOs. Um, and, and that's why I made the comment, I don't, we would have no problem giving me 20 or $30 an acre in federal crop insurance to farm that piece of land, which it should never ever be farmed. Um, and by converting it to pasture, I've, I've put it in permanent cover. I've created some jobs for the people that build fence. We've done some things. We're doing our best to restore habitat. But uh, it literally is uh, a labor of love, for lack of better words. And when I look at the needs for whether it be education funding or infrastructure funding or other things that we need desperately in our counties, I look at the number of kids on free and reduced lunch. I think, why are we funneling this kind of money into us doing the wrong thing. And, and it's hard for us as farmers, you know, you've got to feed your family, but at the same time, uh, Iowa's farmers are an incredible resource and an incredible treasure. And it'd be wonderful if we could just have the tools instead of, uh, you know, I think they called it freedom to farm when I started. I just want freedom to do the right thing. Thanks, Seth. The next question is for Jackie. Um, how does faith in climate interact in your opinion? Um, and maybe a follow-up question would be, um, how do you use your faith network to educate on climate issues? Well, I believe as a, a person of faith that um, I have uh, been called to be a steward of resources. And, um, and I call the people that I have been that I pastor to that same call. Um, what was the second question? Remind me again. How do you use your network within? Oh, your... okay. All right. And so, um, yeah, so, you know, as um, in, in, in my particular tradition, we have uh, a set of principles that, that are our guidelines for how to um, protect our environment how to uh, conserve resources. And um, I have to admit, it's very difficult, especially during this time, you know, you, you think about all the renewable resources that we use that now seem to be uh, kind of taking a backseat to combating the virus. Uh, but uh, my biggest one is food. Uh, I used to, when I taught, I used to tell students that we, the food we throw away in the garbage can could feed a small country. And so I just remind people that, you know, food is uh, a, an opportunity to live simply so others can simply live. We have plenty of food in this country, like Seth was saying, there's plenty of food. Our farmers are, are doing a tremendous amount of work. It isn't being distributed pop, uh, properly. And so to work on that distribution is one of one of the areas that uh, we're working on right now with with both of my faith communities is how can we better distribute our, our food resources. All right, thank you. All right, the last question here um, we'll have for Michelle. Uh, the pandemic gives us an opportunity to try new things um, and make significant changes in your communities that you're working in. What uh, opportunities do you see for climate response in this time? One of, the, one of the projects that we have um, started, um, Lance Brisbois, who is one of my coworkers here, has started a Lost Hills Native Prairie Seed Project. And we started that last year where we had volunteers come out and into public land and, and selectively hand harvest prairie seed. Uh, and then um, in partnership with Iowa Western Community College, uh, propagated those seeds and then put them back out into public lands. Um, uh, to actually, you know, reinvigorate or reestablish um, prairie. Uh, so working with our county conservation boards and uh, the Nature Conservancy and Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation and other groups. Um, what we have seen is that there's an incredible interest and, and we have just seen a number of people that, uh, like I said earlier, have never taken the opportunity to, you know, hike a trail or, or be out in nature and because of COVID, uh, I think it's opened up that that pathway and that doorway uh, to people that have you know been content to sit in their backyard and and realize that there is this 
tremendous natural resource uh, that runs the full coast of, of Iowa. And so, um, you know, one of the projects that we've been working on the last couple of years uh, through incentive grants from the Mid-American Energy Foundation uh, has been to leverage uh, partnerships to build out the outdoor recreation infrastructure uh, as a means of, of partnership. And right now we are coming up on about $16 million of shared investments over the last three years um, to increase trails, to increase you know, access to cabins, to giving people an opportunity to get out into the outdoors um, and who maybe haven't used that. And for a couple of reasons, first of all, we know that that's going to attract a workforce. It's gonna retain a workforce that our next generation is interested in being engaged with the, with the outdoors. Um, and also it's an opportunity for a new economic driver in areas that should not be farmed, you know, that, that are not suitable for farming, but might be suitable for another economic input for our rural communities. And so, you know, I think that the outdoor recreation aspect is something that has, has flourished under COVID. And hopefully it's something that we can continue when we're all healthy and safe again too. Thank you. And thanks yeah. again to all the panelists for participating today. Um, Matt will be coming back on video to um, end with a closing reflection. Matt, are you still there? I'm still here. I think Irene has to un... There we go, start my video, okay. Go. All right, I, again, thank you everyone for joining us today for this important discussion and really focus not only on the challenges, but the solutions. The, these are not challenges that, are, that, that we cannot solve and move forward. But as the discussion shows, they're challenging, they take investments and they take us working together. So thank you for being a part of all of that. Um, we close in reflection today with this Unitarian prayer. From all that dwells below the skies, let faith and hope with joy arise. Let beauty, truth, and good be sung through every land by every tongue. May it be so. All right, thanks again for the panelists today for participating and all participants who um, have joined us today. I know we didn't get to all the questions, um, but we will try to um, interact with you individually um, to answer your questions if we can. Um, otherwise, again, this is being recorded, so um, we will be sending out the link to the recording so you can watch back if you would like. Um, and I think that is all. Have a great day.